we are going to go ahead and get started on our next panel. Um, our speakers for our next panel, um, in keeping with um, our, our path for today, um, are really experienced um, clinic volunteers and also attorneys working in um, trauma-informed legal practice. Um, so our speakers are Christian Santana, Riti Mukhopadhyay, and Kate Francis for this next panel. Um, I will let you all introduce yourselves um, in the way that you see fit for this next panel. For just a quick agenda note for attendees, we will go until noon with this panel, and then we will take a half hour break for lunch. Um, and, um, and just a quick reminder that um, in the chat, you'll find links to our evaluation form and our partial CLE attendance form. Um, and I think that is everything that I have. So Christian, Reedy, and Kate, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Denise. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'll just start out by introducing myself. I am Reedy Mukopade. I'm the director of the Sexual Violence Law Center. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I've been with SVLC for almost, uh, almost 10 years. I uh, was an attorney at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project previously and um, was a public defender in a previous life. And now our program works on sexual assault cases. Um, uh, Sexual Violence Law Center uh, provides holistic representation and legal assistance to survivors of sexual assault, harassment, stalking, abuse. Um, recognizing that there are several legal consequences of experiencing sexual assault. The average survivor experiences 18 to 19 legal issues. And so our focus is to be able to address all those legal issues holistically. Um, and then I'll pass it to Christian. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Christian Santana. I am finishing up, I'm about to start my last year of law school at Uni University of Washington. And I'm here, I guess, because I'm really passionate about um, mental health as it relates to the law. Um, my past experience includes working with unaccompanied minors, right? So like where, where trauma informed um, interviewing was critical. And um, I got the, the pleasure of being the mental health um, and wellness advocate for my school. And so I just, I'm here to share a little bit of uh, some more tips on how to take care of yourself while caring for others. Um, Kate. I am Kate Francis. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a staff attorney at the DV Legal Advocacy Project, which is a pro bono program at the King County Bar Association where we represent survivors of domestic violence in family law and protection order cases. Um, and before that, I was a legal advocate at the Domestic Abuse Women's Network for several years. Um, so I've been working with survivors of domestic violence for a long time. So we actually, um, so I know a lot of trauma-informed presentations, they, uh, there are all these like graphics about like the brain and how trauma affects the brain and things like that. Um, we decided to keep it simple and we're essentially posting our questions or the topics that we're uh, covering and um, we'll have a short video for you, but these questions are not only for Kate, Christian, and me to be responding to, but there's actually a lot of knowledge among our attendees. So please feel free to put your responses to these questions in the chat as well so that we can be learning from each other. And so we'll uh, just kind of starting off, what does it mean to be trauma-informed? Kate, do you want to start off with this one? Sure. Um, so I think when I think about what it really means to be trauma informed is I think about it as a way that when I'm working with my clients who have experienced trauma, that I approach that representation, um, in a certain way. And it's really finding a way to recognize the role that trauma plays in the lawyer client relationship. You know, it affects how we work with our clients and it's just sort of a lens to view your clients in the way that you're 
working with them and their behaviors. Um, and one thing I want to highlight that Paige talked a little bit about in the last session um, is the idea of focusing more on the strengths of your clients and not as much on, you know, what is wrong with your client, right? So Paige gave the example of maybe the client is not showing up for clinic appointments and not making the assumption that they don't value your time as an attorney, but thinking about, you know, what is actually happening in their lives that's preventing them from being able to show up. Um, Another example of this, I think comes up a lot with attorneys is that we, when we're talking with a client and we'll talk more about how trauma sort of manifests in an attorney client relationship, but sometimes, um, the client might not be talking to you about what's happened in a very linear way. And our, we're trained as attorneys to think that makes them not credible, right? And so we're already trying to identify a problem and how we're going to fix that problem. But a trauma-informed approach views it differently and helps us as attorneys to recognize what is actually going on and help build on those strengths of the client instead of trying to fix something for them. I I agree. I I think a part of also being trauma informed is understanding what trauma is and that trauma um, is different for every, every person. Uh, An event that I might not find traumatic could be very traumatic for somebody else. Um, But recognizing that the trauma itself is essentially the long term adverse effect that is going to end up affecting affecting how that client engages with, how that survivor, we use language survivor a lot in our work, uh, working with sexual assault survivors, how that client um, perceives and navigates systems because of the effect of that trauma. And so that means really adapting to the client's needs. Um, So what does that mean? So um, maybe this isn't possible in a clinic setting, but if there is flexibility, For example, uh, instead of having our clients who are coming to a downtown office trying to deal with parking when they're already dealing with trauma that may um, maybe uh, make it difficult difficult for them to deal with traffic and serve the downtown crowd, us then figuring out a location that feels safe for the client to meet with us. really affirming their responses. I think about how clients, especially when they're meeting with attorneys, culturally, um, in media, through like how we talk about lawyers, uh, we make it seem like our time is more valuable than like other people's time. Um, And so uh, I think about like so many of um, clients who like when they are having an emotional reaction, maybe they're crying or they're getting upset, and then they start apologizing for what is a very natural response to what their experience has been, really making sure to take the time to affirm those uh, responses that the client um, is, the the client's responses. Um, Awareness of the system, we are involved in a system that has justified genocide, that has justified racism, that has justified homophobia, transphobia, that has justified many forms of discrimination and persecution in the past. And there are still, well, not just remnants, there are very strong threads of these practices in our legal system. And to actually acknowledge that with our clients, recognizing that they are now engaged in a system that can be hostile to them, instead of kind of taking this neutral, like, oh, this is what the law says. Um, As long as we follow what the rules say and what the law says, we'll be fine. Um, Also transparency. I think transparency is so important. And um, what does it mean to be trauma-informed? Just making sure that the client and the survivor is always in the position of having knowledge about where the process is, where the process is going, and what their options are. Um, I think those are those are practices that really help being trauma informed. Um, Christian, anything anything else that we may have left out? 
Yeah, really quickly, um, I, I just want to add that I think a big part of being trauma informed is also just being informed on the client's background, on the client's um, cultural background as well. I just that I think it's so important that Denise touched upon earlier this morning on the problems be, um, facing our communities. And I say this because, um, for example, I worked with unaccompanied minors, so refugee children, mostly from Central America. And it was really important for us to learn um, just about like the, the, the problems in that community, right? The, and also just like the, the cult, social cultural like issues as well. So for example, um, we, we would give like know your rights presentation and then like intake the kids one by one. And um, one of the big issues that we would talk about, we incorporated was mental health, right? Is a lot of these kids come with like a lot of trauma. And so we would encourage them to speak to, to a therapist or a mental health um, professional. Um, and a lot of times they would say, well, you know, like, why would I do that? I'm not crazy, right? Or like the, the sponsors would also like push back as well. Um, and so part of being, I think, um, informed is also just like, kind of like taking a step back and being like, okay, like this is what this means, right? Kind of slowly guiding guiding these, these um, individuals through the process, what that looks like and, and um, understanding, right? Like where they're coming from, meeting them um, from, from their perspective, I think is super important when it comes to um, trauma-informed um, just care and advocacy and interviewing. So with that, um, we actually wanted to raise this question uh, uh, also because the legal system by its very nature is very adversarial. Um, so sometimes it can sound trauma-informed, especially within the legal community, seems counter to how our system is set up. Um, there have been these sort of small spaces that have been carved out, such as mental health court, um, some diversion courts. Um, but we just wanted to pose the question about like trauma-informed practice within the entire legal system with um, applying it at all aspects um, of the legal practice. And so, um, Kate, do you wanna start off with this one? Yeah, and I think if people have thoughts too, they should share them in the chat because um, we'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts too. But um, I think when thinking about this question, we have to remember that, Rita, you had said this, but you know the whole legal system can be a traumatic experience for someone to access. And as attorneys, we are seen as part of that system. And so it's not just in you know, specialty courts that it's important to be trauma informed, but that, you know, in all um, legal settings, it, it is really important to have that background and approach how we work with clients. And the other thing is that we know that trauma is very common. I think um, many, many people experience trauma in all different ways in their lifetime, and they bring those experiences to the legal system. And really, for the most part, people who are accessing the legal system probably have gone through some sort of trauma because you wouldn't be accessing the legal system, um, you know, if everything were going well in your life, probably. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind when working with clients who have any kind of issue. Um, and then the other thing is that we also know that, you know, those who are most marginalized experience the most trauma, especially you know, queer and trans BIPOC communities. And so when thinking about it in the context of working at the QLaw clinic, it's important to have a trauma-informed approach for every client meeting, regardless of what their legal issue is that they're coming to you with. Thank you for that, Kate. I, I know um, our, with a lot of our clients, we're working in some of the most hostile aspects of the court system, both on the civil and the criminal side. Um, and I, I also think it's really important to recognize that the trauma-informed practices can be applied to all parties. Um, like Kate said, uh, people are engaging with the legal system either because they're in crisis or because they're responding to a crisis. Nobody, um, at least with many of our clients, they don't necessarily have a choice about getting involved with the legal system. Um, and by applying it, not just to your client, but also even to opposing party, it really is about um, recognizing their humanity and upholding their dignity and maintaining their dignity um, as much as you can in an adversarial system. So 
not only am I applying this and how I'm communicating with my client, how I'm asking them questions and direct, how I'm talking about the case in the courtroom before the judge and the kind of narrative that I'm setting related to my client's experience. Um, I'm also applying it to how I'm talking to the opposing party um, on the stand, the way I'm asking questions, the way I speak about them in my closing, in my arguments, um, but those are choices that I can be making and how I talk about the case and both parties. And uh, so trauma-informed not only is about that direct one-on-one -on -one interaction, but I do think a part of it is, especially in the courtroom setting, is also thinking about the kind of narrative that you are creating related to the parties, all of the parties involved. Um, this can become really difficult if you're dealing with maybe a particularly aggressive um, opposing counsel. Most of our cases, uh, opposing party is represented. Um, and so then uh, there are some additional mindfulness practices that can be very helpful. It's really hard to be trauma-informed sometimes depending on who, uh, who you're talking to, but um, it doesn't mean that the courtroom setting, an adversarial setting cannot be a space to be engaging in trauma-informed practices. Um, I'm gonna move to the next slide, which is how have you seen trauma manifest in your clients? Um, Kate, do you wanna start this one off too? Sure. Um, so I think this is, I mean, this is a big question and it can trauma manifest in all different ways depending on who the client is. And so I, for me, I'll just give some examples um, that I have seen, but you know, keep it in mind that people are unique and they express their trauma in all different ways. Um, and so, you know, often when in, especially for me, when I'm working with clients who are survivors of domestic violence, the clients often come in, um, and, you know, the first time that they're meeting with me, they're not often, um, you know, we haven't built that trusting relationship. And so they may be not wanting to share all the details of their story, um, or maybe they even minimize the abuse or trauma. Um, and other ways that trauma can manifest is, you know, expressing not very much emotion when talking about the trauma that has happened, um, or seeming distracted, um, or maybe anxious, and then um, also seeing sort of like a lack of follow through with clients who, you, you know, you feel like you have to keep asking them the same thing over and over again to get them to do something we've asked them to do. So those are a lot of things that I've seen working with my clients. I also want to point out that for the QLA clinic specifically, right now it's over the phone. So you're having a client conversation over the phone where you're not getting as much of their body language, but trauma still can manifest over the phone. So what I've noticed is maybe there's like a long pause when you're talking to them um, or they may lose their train of thought when you're talking through their story, um, having a hard time talking about really specifics of their story. Again, I talked about this earlier, but sort of non-linearly talking about what has happened to them. And then another big one I think we see is that trauma manifests itself in anger and it can come out in all different ways, but often you as the attorney who are meeting with the client, especially in the clinic setting, you're the person that's there listening to them. And sometimes anger is the emotion that comes out for them. Um, and so as an attorney in that situation, it's really important not to react to that and remember that this is just another manifestation of their trauma. I know um, it's with uh, one thing that's really counter intuitive in the legal system is, uh, or one thing that's complicated about the legal system is that we want everything to be chronological, logical, linear. And then the, with clients who are dealing with trauma, um, they're responding essentially opposite to exactly how the legal system wants them to respond. 
Um, the other thing that uh, how I see trauma manifest with my clients is um, uh, the need for a lot of repetition sometimes. And um, the way I, I understand it is um, if we're thinking about our brain and how our brain has developed, the oldest part of our brain is the reptilian, the brain stem. That is essentially the part of our brain that is focused on surviving. So breathing, eating, sleep, that's, that's the part of our brain that helps us fun, um, maintain those functions. And then as over time, as the brain has developed, um, it's uh, the limbic system, which is sort of the middle part of the brain. Um, that's where it's more sort of memories. Uh, uh, memories are created. That's where our emotions uh, develop. Um, that's where um, we start to develop basic habits. And then there's the front part of our brain, which is the neocortex system. This is the logical part of our brain, the part that uh, deals with language and reasoning and philosophy. So the legal system, and another way to think about it, sorry, I really get into the brain science stuff, is to think about how children develop. They first are born breathing, eating and sleeping, and then they start with like movement and muscle movement and starting to show emotion and laughing and crying. And then at the very end of sort of child development is when the language and the reasoning skills start to develop because that is how their brains are also developing. The legal system wants us to be up here at the front constantly. And then our clients often are sort of kind of at the, uh, with the trauma are sort of dealing with all the aspects of the um, lower parts of the brain. And so two parts of the brain are essentially kind of colliding um, at the same time. And so this is where Sometimes you see the clients appear confused um, or they're not retaining information well, um, or you have to explain the same thing in a couple of different ways. Um, it's not because the client isn't invested or if they, it isn't that they don't care about the issue, but there is actually neurological reasons why some of that information is not going to necessarily um, um, be retained as easily. And so this is where it's really helpful to be thinking about like, how do you share information in a couple of different ways? Um, also recognizing that uh, trauma is gonna manifest itself. Kate talked about anger, um, but you can end up seeing a whole range of emotions with your clients, depending on how you're, long you're working with them. So uh, one time it might be um, a lot of um, maybe tears, and um, sadness, next time it could be anger. So also being aware that it can be sort of the full spectrum of uh, emotional um, responses to kind of talking about a very traumatic experience. And then Christian, I know you have a whole section talking about compassion fatigue and burnout, but is there anything else that you wanna add here? Um, I have more, but I'll touch on it at the end. Thank you, Reedy. Okay. So what are some trauma-informed strategies that you've applied outside of the courtroom and in the courtroom? This is where please, please, please um, do add to the chat because I know that many of you have strategies and thoughts about this. Um, and uh, Kate, do you want to take it away? Sure. So I think there's a lot that we can dive into here, but one thing that I want to start off with talking about is when you first meet a client, especially in a clinic context, I think one of the most important things you can do to set yourself up and the client up for a successful meeting is to have some predictability in the meeting itself. Um, and so for me, this looks like, you know, starting off the meeting by explaining why we're here, what my role is, what's gonna happen during the meeting, do we have time limitations, what those are, um, and what kind of things that I might be asking the client during the meeting. So an example for me during a clinic meeting, I might say, you know, we have 30 minutes or an hour to talk today and you know, I can provide you some legal information and advice today, but you know, I can't represent you outside of this clinic appointment. Um, 
I may say, you know, I can connect you with resources afterwards, but you know, that is going to be the extent of my follow-up. And then talking to the clients about what information that you already have from them. I think Paige talked about this in the last session where at the QLA clinic specifically, often if the client is coming back multiple times for appointments, there are notes. So you can review those notes. Um, and that way you don't have to get the full story from your client every time and they don't have to keep retelling a story even though probably each time they're coming to the clinic they're meeting with a different attorney and I think that helps people feel heard and then this is challenging in the clinic setting when we're on the phone but as much as you can give the client options about the meeting so you know it lets them have some control about what's happening and then also being aware of signs of trauma when they're popping up. You know, as Reedy said, trauma can manifest in all different ways. Um, and often it, it can, the emotions that you, the client may express can range. Even in a clinic appointment, I think you may see that happen. And so just being aware that when the trauma, when there are signs of trauma and thinking through what might be triggering that trauma. Um, and then also trying to build that trust with your client. And that's something that I do in my practice because I'm working with clients over multiple appointments, but I think you can still do this in a clinic setting. Um, and it, it comes from really listening to your client's story and making them feel heard and also validating your client's feelings. I think um, it can help them be aware of what's happening, but also let the client know that you care about them and their emotional safety. Um, and this is really important, I think, because it, it contradicts really what happens in a traumatic incident. So when someone's experiencing trauma, per, the person's feelings of anxiety or fear are often ignored or dismissed. And so you want to approach your client's relationship by letting them know that you're listening to them, you're hearing them, you're validating their feelings. Um, and some ways you can do that is just simply saying something like, you know, that sounds like that was really scary or that was really hurtful. Or you could even say, you know, it means a lot to me that you're sharing that with me, um, even though it's really hard for you to talk about. So things like that, um, I think can be super helpful. And I'll let Reedy jump in a little bit. Thanks, Kate. Um, I think you already touched on uh, acknowledging the loss or the fear is just so, so crucial um, because the legal setting has a tendency to want to take emotion out of it. But sometimes that emotional response is just such a core part of how the client is um, dealing and processing that pro uh, that crisis, that trauma. Um, in a clinic setting, even though your time is more limited than a case, than where where you might be providing long term representation, taking the time to do a little bit of rapport building so that you're not jumping straight into the traumatic issue. Um, this is where you have to be a little thoughtful, applying some of the um, considerations that Kelsey and Paige talked about. Um, you do have to be thoughtful about kind of how you start um, building that rapport. I always think like helpful kind of safe topics to start with. Um, people have a tendency to ask about children. That's actually not a safe topic to talk about, especially with a lot of our clients um, who maybe um, have experienced like a lot of trauma just in the family law setting. Um, but like maybe, um, you know, cooking. <laughs> I think about things that clients uh, end up like talking about, like cooking, pets, um, activities that they enjoy. Washington is a place where like hiking is something and like being outdoor in nature is something that a lot of people identify with. It sounds very basic, but also when your client during that meeting might um, be responding to uh, you know, working on a traumatic declaration and is having a hard time going through questions that um, you're asking about, being able to come back to those topics is essentially help them reset, distract. 
um, and give them that pause so that they don't have to stay in that traumatic moment um, can be really helpful. So that rapport building at the beginning can be really helpful. Um, learning from the community. Paige said it about like, you know, taking the time to Google Denise Kula. The Kula team is here to be a resource for you so that you can learn from the community. And it's not on the, the burden is not on the client themselves to teach you about their identity. Um, that I think can be really helpful in trying to apply um, trauma-informed strategies. Um, also in the previous session, uh, the a nod to uh, Dr. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and intersectionality, recognizing those intersectional identities that our clients uh, come with to us and not to make the, an assumption just based on race or gender or um, sexual orientation or ability, and but recognizing all those identities, how they intersect and how they uh, um, essentially shape your client's experience and how they've been navigating systems. So being mindful of that. Um, Language, um, there are two parts to language that I think is really important to think about related to um, trauma-informed practices. One is the language that we use, how accessible are we making it? At, in a clinic setting, they already know you are an attorney. You do not have to prove that you are an attorney by using complicated language. The more you can make the information accessible and break it down in um, easier ways, um, that that is going to actually help that that client, um, that survivor, um, that person seeking your assistance. The other part of language is understanding cultural language, um, how the client may be explaining something. Uh, being um, this is where being able to do a little bit of your homework and or not being afraid to like get clarification can be really helpful. Um, so, for example working with survivors, uh, depending on their cultural background, they may not have even known the word. I'll actually apply the example to myself. I, uh, before law school, I actually volunteered as an interpreter for a very long time working with survivors. And in my own mother tongue, I did not know the word for rape until I started working I, uh, in, in this area. I did not know the words to describe uh, my anatomy in, uh, in my own mother tongue and um, recognizing that language, cultural language can sometimes be a barrier. Uh, so paying attention to language and uh, understanding that can be really helpful. Um, connecting uh, your client to other resources, I think is another really important aspect of being trauma-informed. They are not coming only to you with one legal issue, they probably have multiple legal issues. So who might be able to assist with those other legal areas is one question. The other thing is there are a lot of non-legal issues, a lot of uh, maybe psychological needs, um, mental health needs, social service needs, um, that it would be really helpful to be able to assist that client to at least get connected to a resource. You do not have to be an expert in everything, but at least knowing some of those resources can really help um, with a client who's experiencing trauma and trying to navigate a lot of complicated systems while dealing with their trauma. Um, this is outside of the courtroom. In the courtroom, um, even though in a clinic setting, you are not uh, accompanying somebody to the courthouse and you're not um, actually representing them in the court process, but being able to actually talk through not only the legal process itself, but even the basics of how do you get to the courthouse, which is like the entry. Like, so for example, the Seattle courthouse, only one of the entrances are open right now. It can feel, it created a source of panic for me the first time I went in the door that I thought was going to be open and they had locked it. Um, so if you're already hyped, worked up and you're already um, panicked about your court case and then the courtroom appears locked, the courthouse appears locked, um, that can really set uh, somebody back. So even talking about how do you get to the courthouse, which entrance do you take, which floor do you go, what does the courthouse look like, um, how is a courtroom set up. In the virtual setting, 
it all it's very similar. Those small issues can become feel like insurmountable barriers when you're dealing with trauma. So talking about, you know, is the courthouse using Zoom? Are they using a telephonic process for a hearing? How do you call in? How do you find out about like when the court's going to call you if you're in a virtual space? Like talking through even those small procedural processes in the courtroom can really, really help. Um, I think I think that was a lot. So I'll just pause there. Anything else before we move to the next one? I was going to jump in and lift up. This is Denise. I was going to jump in and lift up some of the contributions in the chat because I thought we had really um, folks had really good things to add that I want to make sure get um, get included in the recording. Um, one person suggested um, asking questions at the start of a conversation, like, "What do you need during our appointment to feel safe and ready to meet? Do you?" You know, do you need a notebook? Do you need to speak first? Do you need something to fidget with? Do you need sunglasses? I'll often ask folks um, just to add on what the person wrote in the chat. I'll often often ask folks, you know, um, do you have a glass of water ready? Are you do you feel like you're in a quiet spot? Let's take a deep breath and all right, we can dive in. Um, another um, chat person uh, person in the chat lifted up. Um, for the clinic strategy, um, because our clinics are by phone, um, not removing power or control from clients in small ways. Um, I thought this was really helpful because um, the person suggested one of the ways that can seem small or silly is to ask permission to share information with outside resources or partners. But having people that you didn't expect or approve of talking about you can be can feel bad. I think that's a really good point. You know, nobody likes to be, people like to be talked to, not talked about, right? Um, and um, and giving folks control over, you know, I'd like to connect you with a resource that has survivor advocacy, or I'd like to connect you to our friends over at the Sexual Violence Law Center or over at King County Bar Association. Is it okay with you if I share a little bit about your situation with them? Um, that can be really helpful. Um, another contribution um, is um, making uh, not just reading the notes of prior client appointments, but also when you're making your own client report, make a full report with the facts and details for the next attorney. That is really super helpful. Um, <laughs> it's not just us that reads those, but it's also also the attorneys who come after you. Um, and Can I, I add to that, Denise? Yeah, also for me. Also, just letting the client know that you will not maybe be the next attorney the next time because they just built a relationship with you and it could be shocking to them to know that they may not be working with you. So what, along with those detailed notes, letting that person know that you will not be the person that they'll interact with next time, but it will be somebody just as competent who cares just as much about the case. Yeah. And I'll often tell people a couple of things that I've I've done over the over the years of this is I'll often tell people, you know, you will meet with another attorney next time. Um, but um, I will make sure to I'm taking really detailed notes. I will make sure to add these really detailed notes to the intake form so that ideally you don't have to say all of this again. Um, a couple of other pointers. Um, that one I actually learned from um, a reporter locally um, here in Seattle who um, works a lot with unhoused folks who, who are dealing with a lot of trauma um, is the tactic of if you're going to, if, you, if we have to ask people to go into their trauma in order to learn about their legal issue, being um, really being mindful to pull them back to the present. Um, right, so that because you have to remember when you're telling a story about something that is really hard that's happened to you, you go back into that place emotionally, and it helps to ask people questions to pull them back and ground them back to the present. Um, things like, what are your plans for the future, right? If you're talking to someone who is maybe exiting um, a marriage or housing that has been um, that has been abusive, you might ask, like, you know, what is your dream for where you want to be in a year? right? Um, what do you imagine your new house, uh, what do you want your new house to look like, right? Something to pull people back into the present so that they're, they can be with you again. Um, and, um, and then 
I just wanted to add about going into the courtroom, particularly with um, trans clients and trans clients of color specifically, um, I'm always careful to have a conversation with folks about um, what they want to have happen in the courtroom. Some folks will want their representative to really stand up and go to bat for every instance of misgendering, every you know instance of anti-Black bias, potentially, right? Um, other folks are like, can we please just not make a big deal out of it? And, and I just wanna get my order and get the hell out of here, right? Um, and really knowing ahead of time what, do you, what your client feels ready for, what kind of advocacy they want you to take, um, and, um, and really kind of having that, like Reedy said, really walking through a step-by-step -step of like the judge is going to come into the room. They will call everyone to order. We may have to wait a while before they call our case, but when they call our case, I will talk first and you know, I will let you know when it is your turn to talk. Here are the things that you can expect that you need to talk about. Um, with that, I'll stop talking and let y'all get going forward. But thank you to everyone who's putting amazing stuff in the chat. Um, it's really, really helpful to share all of these resources. Reedy, you're on mute. We actually thought, thank you, Christian. Um, it might be helpful since it's just been these slides and us talking to have a little bit of a visual break. So we thought this two minute video is just a nice way of thinking about trauma informed just in a different just presented in a different way. Many of you have seen this video, but um, we love to come back to it all the time because we think it uh, touches on trauma-informed really nicely. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> No, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful. And we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So we just wanted to Brene Brown video because it's just like a nice different way of talking about trauma-informed communication. Um, there is, whoops, one last question that we have that's going to transition to Christian's 
um, section, which is what do you wish you had known about being trauma informed as a new attorney entering into the practice? And we can keep this one short. Um, I'll, I'll just start out saying that um, that trauma informed can actually be a part of the litigation process. Um, in law school, we're so sort of trained to think about the uh, opposing party, the, this adversarial approach. And trauma is just not talked about, uh, even though trauma is so rooted in the legal system. Um, and so the fact that we can be applying these strategies on an ongoing basis um, and that, um, that it really does apply at all levels of, I think, assistance and representation. And that it can also, trauma can also take an, a really big toll on us if we're not thinking about it, which I think Christian's gonna talk about. Um, Kate, what about you? Yeah, I'll just quickly say that one thing I think about a lot is that I think law school trains you as an attorney to be the person that has to fix everything and we have to know all the answers. And often that's not actually what our clients need from us. They need us to be there for them in and help them go through the situation that is super traumatic, but we don't have to have all the answers um, and that's okay. So I think that's in addition to what you had said, Reedy, what I want to add here. And I'll let Christian go into his part. Thank you, Christian. Thanks, Reedy. Thanks, Kate. Kate, that's actually a perfect transition into um, my, my little section regarding like we don't have to have all the answers. We, we can't, right? Um, and so let me go ahead and can I, um, yeah, there you go. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And so obviously if you're here, right, you're interested in volunteering with us, you know, giving your time, um, to, uh, you know, um, giving back to your community and that's super great. Um, so I just want to start off with this one quote that kind of speaks to me. Um, it, it, um, y'all you, can read it, but it's basically talking about how, we, especially people who, you know, who are in public interest or who volunteer their time, you know, to help clients, like we are, um, constantly want to like do the most that we can, right? But if we can't, if we can't take care of ourselves, then we really are in a position to start caring for others. And so um, I'm going to start going into something that we call secondhand trauma. And it actually, um, it goes by many names. Um, you hear, you, um, if you might have seen it as vicarious trauma, secondary tra traumatic um, stress, trauma exposure exposure response and so basically they all they're all different names but they're they're all very similar in the um well according to the american counseling association secondhand or vicarious trauma is a condition that affects many people who interact with those who have experienced a traumatic event and um part of the clinic and through some of the work that you know that being a lawyer entails um involves stressful situations traumatic situations that, that folks um you know go through and a lot of the times, you know, we can't just separate it from our own lives, right? We can't just be, we, you know, at the moment the clock strikes 5 p.m., we can't just like go on into our regular lives without it having affected us. Um, and so, yeah, like it says here, um, when we hear clients talk about what they experience and their physical reactions experience, um, we may also begin to feel these effects of trauma. And just as um, trauma doesn't, doesn't present itself in one singular way, and no, not, nor in our clients, nor with us, right? And so there's this book, it's by um, Lipsky. It's a really, really great book. If, um, I highly recommend. It's called Trauma Stewardship, um, an Everyday Guide to Caring for Self While Caring for Others. And in this book, Lipsky recognizes 16 different common responses to kind of like this, like, um, like this traumatic, like a secondhand traumatic response. And it looks very different depending on different people, right? But I'm sure we've all, I mean, especially in this crazy tough year, we've all kind of felt overwhelmed. We've all felt, you know, like, and, and, and if you've worked with, with clients, you know, that from traumatic backgrounds and, you know, from really stressful backgrounds, I'm sure you, some of you might relate to some of these, you know, including like a sense of like hopelessness, right? Chronic exhaustion, um, anger, cynicism, you know, feeling of like hopelessness, right? Like of, you know, like what is, is what I'm doing even making a huge difference? Um, dissociative moments, inability to empathize. And so um, if you start seeing some of these amongst, you, amongst yourself, right, it's a really good sign for you to kind of just take a step back and to you kind of like ask yourself, right, like, um, am, I, am I doing the most that I can to, to take care of myself and to prioritize my own mental health before 
you know, reaching a hand out, I need to make sure that I'm, it's like, it's like that one saying, right? And, and when you're on an airplane, make sure that you have your, your vest is inflated and make sure that your, yours is operating before helping those of others. And in the same way, that's how we should be operating in terms of our own mental health. Um, what can we do? Um, and again, just as trauma, secondhand trauma, regular trauma presents differently, how we can address it can, is also very, um, it also depends, right? It depends on you. It depends on um, how you react to stress, but there's a couple different ways um, that generally do help. Um, the biggest one that I can suggest for everyone is um, a work-life balance and separation, right? That separation part, it's been a little bit harder um, in a pandemic year where a lot of us are working from home and that, you know, like that separation kind of like it's starting to like fade away, but something that can help is, for example, like that, you know, what, um, sometimes we, we work over, you know, more hours, that's, that's normal to an extent, and it's not something that you should be like, you should be trying, not, you know, to do um, less of, but um, trying to be present, right, when you're working, you're working, but the moment you're finishing, right, trying to like leave, the, you know, try, try not to like answer like emails during dinner or whatever, right, when time away from work should be um, specifically away from that, so separating your work and your life um, to maintain that balance is super critical. Um, advocating for yourself at work and in and normal life, right? Make learning how to say no to like, you know, this this other assignment that you, you don't think you can handle, but you don't want, you know, so, but you don't want to say no to your supervisor or whatever, you know, setting those limits is super important. Um, learning, knowing when to rest and relax, right? Making sure you're getting your eight hours of sleep, um, mindful intention, meditation. Um, there's a really great app, for example, called Calm, and that helps, that, that has a lot of like really cool like guided meditations that can really help you like just kind of like, you know, get into that mind, that state of mindfulness and relaxation. Um, use those vacation and sick days, right? We have them for a reason. Make sure that you are actually using them. A um, um, really, really big one is connecting with others and knowing when to ask for help, right? And of course, it's, um, it's a little different for attorneys, right? We have confidentiality. We have specific rules. But, you know, being able to talk, if, if, if you're overwhelmed about a specific client, a specific case, being able to talk to your coworkers, right? The individuals that you can talk to and just in general, um, if you're feeling a specific way, um, talking to people you trust, your loved ones, right? Um, so, um, so there's support groups out there for people working with, um, you know, um, in, in stressful situations, situations that involve trauma. Um, and of course, if, if there's anything that I can kind of say, speak to you all about is uh, it's the importance of mental health in terms of like therapists, um, psychiatrists. There's a lot of really great resources out there. Um, if you have access to it, I highly suggest it, right? Everyone can benefit from a therapist, especially um, for people that are doing the kind of work that we're doing, which is, you know, working with, um, you know, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people from traumatic backgrounds. And I think that that is something that I cannot, like, overemphasize, like, how important and how great um, that need is. Um, and, of course, when you're, you're not working, right, do what you enjoy, right? Exercise, paint, cook, start a journal, like, these exercises to kind of, like, take your mind off things to kind of really, or even reflect, you know, um, you know, meditate, you know, these are all activities that you can do, which really do help with your, you know, your mind state and everything. Um, another thing that I don't think we do often enough as, um, you know, um, public interest practitioners and just, you know, volunteers, anything is to celebrate our work. You know, oftentimes we, we look at what we haven't accomplished or what, what's, what's left when we don't like take a step back and say, wait, no, I've actually, we've done these amazing things. I've, I've advocated for this, right? I really, I helped out this client in a really meaningful way. Um, be proud of, of those positive outcomes that you helped facilitate. And yeah, take, definitely take that time to celebrate and, um, you know, look, look back, reflect, how can I be, how can I be better? But also how, what have I done? And, you know, what can I be proud of? Um, and ultimately just plan for coping, right? Like, life has ups and downs. There are really stressful periods. There are times where this, where the, the pain of others, the trauma of others is going gonna, is gonna to impact you more so than other times. And so I guess I'm asking everyone to kind of just like reflect, plan ahead, identify the strategies that work best for you and kind of just like keep that in the back of your head, even write it down. And when you are in a, in a, in a place, in a mental health space where you maybe, um, you know, need help, or, you know, or, or, you know, you, you need support, you can kind of like identify, well, I, it really helps me when I speak to like this person, right? My coworker who, who also deals with cases like this, or, you know, like X, Y, Z, right? I really enjoy like running and that really helps take the stress off, you know, just kind of identifying what works for you is the best way to kind of um, preemptively taking care of yourself would be, is like really ideal. Um, 
Um, I think I'm running short on time, but like for those of you who, for example, there are some supervisors here, right? There are people who maybe do have, have some sort of influence, right? Just making sure that, you know, like, or, or just like, you know, people who are you, 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 having these kinds of suggestions, right? Making sure that you um, prioritize for people who are in charge of promoting and prioritizing the staff's health, right? Um, making sure that um, as employers, you, you know, that offer professional training, encourage staff development, promote and provide counseling resources and making sure that everyone's like putting in their fair sh share are things that, you know, employers can do, workplaces can do to really help alleviate some of the stress. But ultimately, what I would ask all of you to do is to talk to yourself like someone you would love, right? Um, just please be kind to yourself, patient. This has been a crazy year. Um, in the, the, it's been an unprecedented like pandemic. There's just been so much stressors. Just please be kind and patient with yourself. Um, and after all, the goal should be to love yourself first and foremost and to treat yourself with the kindness that you would to any client or anyone that you care about. Um, and yeah, um, thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much to all three of you, Reedy, Kate, and Christian. Um, you are all just absolutely, absolutely incredible assets to our legal world and to, um, and to this work. Um, and to what Christian was saying just a minute ago in terms of taking care of yourself, um, you know, as I said um, in the policies and procedures um, portion earlier, you know, one of the difficulties I think and, and isolations that can come with legal work is that we are bound by confidentiality. So we often can't share some of the things that we learn. And, and I know I have had clinic um, consultations over the years um, that have really tested my, you know, tested my resolve, um, particularly in, um, in working with folks who have really um, extreme mental health issues, um, sometimes are not sharing the same reality that I am, and that can be really hard. And so I really encourage you as a volunteer with our program, um, you know, while 80% of the clients that you will talk with are going to be, you know, lovely folks who largely have, um, have themselves together and um, and are relatively straightforward, um, you know, they're struggles do a lot to folks. And so I really want to encourage you as part of our volunteer pool, that part of the reason folks stay as volunteers with our clinic for so long um, is that we provide really deep support and care for our attorneys um, and other volunteers, as well as the clients that we serve. Um, so we really um, offer a lot of resources and just space to kind of connect with another human being after you get off the phone with somebody and it's been an intense conversation, you know, you come into that Zoom room and you can just be like, that was a lot. Can I talk about how that was a lot for a minute? And that I think is really helpful um, and really important for us because we all have to take care of each other. Um, it is not just us taking care of clients. We are all interconnected. So with that, I'm going to close us for lunch. Um, the Zoom room will remain open. So if you're going to, you know, if you want to make sure that you can find us again after your lunch, I encourage you to, um, to go ahead and um, stay in our, um, stay in our, uh, in our Zoom space and just mute yourself and, and turn off your video um, and return at 12.30 um, for our next presentation, which will be on the policies and procedures and rules um, and forms related to identity documents. Our speakers will be Dusty LeMay and Al Littlejohn, um, who are both just incredible resources on this and also just very funny people um, who give a great presentation. So I'm really excited about that. So please join us at 1230 um, and take good care of yourself. Thank you.